You're listening to Blue Jays Nation Radio with Cam Lewis and Tyler Uremchuk, a member of the Nation Network of Podcasts. Welcome into to episode 229 of Blue Jays Nation Radio. Your M. Chuck and Coomsey with you. We are on the Blue Jays Nation YouTube. We are available wherever you get your podcast from, so make sure you like and subscribe. And Coomsey, the first half from hell is finally in the rearview mirror. I, if you could, I don't think you could have scripted a worse first half for the Blue Jays. Let's put it that way. Yeah, it's pretty hard to imagine. I mean, you look at the record 44 and 52 and oddly enough that feels somewhat generous like it feels like the team has had a worse first half than 44 and 52 and i guess it's just because they've been despite that record not looking i mean it's bad but it doesn't it's not you know worst in the league bad but i think that's what what makes it feel so so shitty is just the fact that they haven't really been they haven't really felt that close to the playoffs this year, even when they were like right now, I think they're nine and a half back of the wild card with almost the entire American league to jump. They're ahead of only the LA angels, the Oakland athletics and the Chicago white Sox, a trio of very bad teams in the American league. And yeah, 44 and 52, of course, you know, well back of the Baltimore Orioles and the New York Yankees, the two teams that are competing for the American league East. And I think, we came into this season with with the reasonable expectation that they're not better than New York or Baltimore. They're not going to be competing for the division. But I don't think anybody saw most of the American League jumping over the Jays. The Jays be falling behind most of the American League to the point where we're at the All-Star break and the third wild card being the road wild card team to go in and face whoever the worst division winner is. That's completely out, that feels almost completely out of the question now. Like there hasn't really been any prolonged winning streaks. There hasn't been any ability to keep momentum going. Like even look at this this last little stretch here, the road trip right before we go into the All-Star break. Three series out in the West Coast against Seattle, San Francisco, Arizona, all playoff caliber teams who I wouldn't really consider serious World Series contenders, but solid teams. And the Jays win two of those three series and we're thinking, yeah, you know what? This is a pretty nice solid run, but you put all of it together They've only won five of their last nine games. It's a five and four stretch out there out west in a in a little in a little pocket of games where it felt like, oh, you know what? Like they they won a series in Seattle. That never happens. They won a series in San Francisco. That's you know, that's surprising as well. And even despite that, there there's just no ability to go on a run. So yeah, we're gonna try and draw 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 some positives from the first half. But when I was writing these notes. There weren't very many positives that I could come up with. It, it, it has been a it has been a very ugly first half. Yeah, Ben Nicholson Smith, I thought, had a great tweet yesterday, uh, and it was kind of the lead into his article. He said the Blue Jays won today, but they end their first half with more walk off losses six than Bo Bichette home runs four, and more elbow surgeries two than All Stars, and that <laughs> is. Uh, that is not the way this season was supposed to go. Just before we get into our three up, three down for uh, the first and second half of the season, because we're going to treat this one as more of a, again, first half recap episode than anything. Their bullpen, well, just quickly to talk about the series loss to the Diamondbacks, their bullpen is terrible. Um, that one is without a doubt a down. They only scored, what was it, one run in the second game. Didn't matter because, again, bullpen stunk. Like, everyone was getting lit up, so... I, I think the bullpen stinking was the main down from that series, correct? Even in the game, they ended up winning. I know Kikuchi, the wheels totally fall off and they blow it. Um, but yeah, not a good series. Yeah, this is a hard one to really... I mean, it was hard enough for me to find um, positives from the entirety of the first half. It was hard to find positives from this series. It was a weird one. It was, it, ironically, I remember last when we did the last podcast, we talked about it and we thought, okay, you got to win these first two games because in the series finale on Sunday, they have their ace going and, you know, it's going to be a tough one. And the Jays, you know, they had Kevin Gosman, or sorry, Kevin Gosman started in the San Francisco series. Um, they had good starters going in this one. It was yeah. Barrios and Kikuchi. Um, and you thought, you know what? Like, this is a pretty good blend of starting pitchers. But like you said, the bullpen just completely imploded on them. The bullpen imploded on Friday in a tight game. They lost by a score of 5-4, to four, walk off from Arizona. And then in the next game on Saturday, the um, Jose Barrios didn't have a very strong start at all. But then after he came out of the game, the bullpen just couldn't even really keep it competitive. And then in the Sunday game, the bullpen did actually manage to shut things down um, after, ironically, it was Yusei Kikuchi, the starting pitcher, who kind of had the wheels fall out from underneath him when I think it was four 
innings of shutout and then just completely imploded in the fifth just got lit up but the jays did manage to win that one on the power of vladimir guerrero jr solo home run after they had almost blown a seven nothing lead the thing that i was thinking about in this one um kind of a random thing to be thinking about but they go up seven nothing and then blow the lead and it's tied and then vladdy hit that go ahead home run and i was thinking to myself you know what why isn't this what happened when they were playing Seattle in the playoffs? Why after they blew that lead, couldn't they just get some no-nonsense, no-doubt home run, just get the momentum all right back? That's what I was thinking when that happened, but largely irrelevant. But um, yeah, that series against Arizona didn't uh, didn't didn't generate very much confidence. No, a um, couple quick positives. Uh, Dalton Varsho tripled in every single game in his return back to Arizona. I He keeps showing us these flashes. I shouldn't even say keeps. At times, he's shown us these flashes, and you watch him, and you're like, God, this should be such an exciting player with a great glove and like a good, versatile, left-handed bat. And for him to figure it out would be so big. Um, also, Kevin Kiermaier, fresh off clearing waiver, smacks a grand slam, which I thought was also kind of hilarious. So a couple of ups from that series as well. I also thought Yariel Rodriguez pitched pretty well. He only ended up going four innings, but only allowed two earned runs, scattered four hits, struck out seven as well. He's got strikeout stuff, which is, again, it's great to see when it's on display. Yeah, it is. That's uh, That's been one of the kind of the smaller positives from this season is Yariel Rodriguez and his electric stuff. That's like a... That's a nice thing that's come out of this year because I remember there was a lot of people talking about, oh, why not re-sign Jordan Hicks? Because he wants to be a starter. You give that a try. If it doesn't work out, you know you have a good lockdown reliever. The Jays instead went and handed out a multi-year guaranteed contract to Yariel Rodriguez, somebody who a little bit more of a wild card. He, you know, he pitched really well in Japan, but that was in a reliever role that was in single inning performances. And then of course you're coming out of Cuba. So the numbers there, it's kind of hard to say like what happens in Cuba. How is that going to translate over to the big league level? like it was a risk of a signing and he has been injured he's been on and off the injured list this year but when Yariel Rodriguez has been healthy he's looked very electric and this looks like this looks like one of those one of those signings they made in the offseason that should help the team for years to come yeah. All right. Let's do our three up three down for the first half of the season, Coombsy. And, and we obviously need to start with the three down from this uh, from this first <laughs> half, from this first what was it 90 some games of baseball. But I think the biggest one is just the fact that the bats never bounced back. And that was you can talk about adding Justin Turner. You can talk about adding IKF. But the biggest bet this front office made was on the guys who were in the clubhouse last season and going, okay, Springer will be better. Vladdy will be better. Bo will be better. And the reality is none of them really got better. Uh, the Blue Jays ranked 24th in baseball in runs per game, averaging just over four per game. 86 home runs is 27th in the majors as well. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see some of these numbers like it's ugly. The big bet was that the offense could not be as bad as it was last year because there's too much talent, and that ended up being the wrong bet to make. Yeah, this is a. Uh, I mean, I mean, who's who's really surprised? To be totally honest with you, like yeah. I don't think we necessarily saw the offense being this bad, being 24th in baseball and runs per game, just a shade over four runs a game. That's even worse than it was last season. They were right in the middle of the pack, 20th in batting average at 236. Then the OPS is all the way down at 688. And then 86 home runs over the course of the season, better only than the White Sox, Nationals, and Miami Marlins. I mean, you look at the team when you have it sorted by OPS, and this is just the guys who are qualified who have had enough bats. Vladdy's the only guy on the team with an OPS over 800 out of qualified hitters. Then the next best guy is Isaiah Kiner Falefa, the signing that you know we all laughed at in the offseason. We thought this is the guy you're going to bring in to replace Matt Chapman. And I mean, Matt Chapman doesn't even have a huge bat. And people were skeptical that IKF could come in and do any better. And he has. They the one signing that 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 people were really critical of and skept, skeptical of has ultimately come through and been even better than most people probably expected. And then the only ones over 700 here for OPS among qualified hitters, Ernie Clement, Danny Jansen, and Davis Schneider, and they're all the way down in the low 700s. Dalton Barsho, he's below 700. Justin Turner had that great start to the season below 700. George Springer, he's had a little bit of a hot streak recently, but just such a slow start to the season. He had to be knocked out of the number one, the leadoff spot in the lineup and brought down lower. His OPS is down 676. Bo Bichette, this has obviously been the most shocking one, 596. And then Kevin Kiermeyer, he had that huge season for the Blue Jays last year on the one-year contract. 
gets another one-year contract and his OPS this year is 540 cleared through revocable waivers and nobody wanted to grab him on that contract which is I mean really no surprise so yeah the Blue Jays came into they had the season last year where the offense was mediocre and everyone said you got to go out in the offseason add a big bat didn't really add a big bat and here we are again you know George Springer hasn't improved Bo's gotten worse Vladdy's slightly better Alejandro Kirk hasn't really rebounded Dalton Barshow's sort of rebounded but it's been very inconsistent the bats just aren't there they built a team that doesn't score all that many runs and it's it's a really different team than Blue Jays fans are used to seeing you know for years the Blue Jays were known even when they were bad even in those seasons the rebuilding years think 2018 and 2019 that team still hit a lot of bombs and scored a lot of runs and here we are now during the competitive window and this is just not the version of the team anybody really expected the Bowen Vlad years to look like. like. I think we all expected the Bowen Vlad years to look similar to the Bautista and Encarnacion years. The Jays are scoring a whole bunch of runs, and then you mix that with a good pitching staff, and good things are going to happen. But they they kind of forgot the uh, scoring runs is an integral part of winning baseball games. Yeah, um, that's just something they flat out failed to address in the offseason. And you kind of wonder, again, we're sitting here watching Kevin Kiermaier struggle. We're watching Dalton Varsho play great baseball in center field. And one of the things you and I, and it, it, part of it was nostalgia, but you kind of look back on it in hindsight and go, would have made sense. What if they would have went and thrown some money at Teoscar Hernandez? That's a guy who's hit 19 home runs this season with the LA Dodgers. Like that's five more home runs than anyone else on the Blue Jays have. They only have four guys who are in the double digits for home runs at the halfway mark of the season. He's got an OPS north of 800 on the year. Like, you know, instead of dishing out 10 million to Kevin Kiermaier, what if you just would have gulped and said, hey, Tay Oscar, here's the 25 and we're giving it to you up front, which is not what the Dodgers did. The Dodgers are doing the whole deferral thing with him, too. Right. So could you have dished out the money and brought back Tay Oscar? But the flip side of it is even if the bats were producing five runs a game instead of four the the pitching just has also fallen off a cliff and we're, i'm gonna sound like a broken record because we've done this conversation a bunch of times but part of the danger in betting on things improving from last year is that you're simultaneously betting on things that went well last year going well for you again and last year the starting pitching rotation was remarkably healthy and remarkably effective Kevin Gosman gets off to a late start in spring training. He hasn't looked like himself. Alec Manoa is done for the year. Yariel Rodriguez comes in, starts to show signs that maybe he can be a guy for the Jays, and then he gets injured for a bit as well. On top of that, Kikuchi hasn't been the same. Barrios has been hit and miss since his first six weeks of the season when we were talking about a Cy Young candidacy. Um, Ricky Tiedemann hasn't come up. We were talking about that. You know, second half of the season, does Ricky Tiedemann come give your either your the back end of your rotation a bit of a bump? Like, None of these things have gone well for the Jays. So even if they would have added a power bat like Teoscar Hernandez and been scoring more runs, they're maybe only three wins better because the rotation hasn't been what it was last year. Yeah, this was kind of the thing was, I, I know there was a lot of people that were skeptical that the bats were going to bounce back. And among those people, you kind of thought, okay, if the bats don't bounce back, then what the Jays are going to need is for the starting pitching rotation to be at least as good as it was last season, like somewhere in the same realm. And the Jays had one of the best starting rotations last year. And like you said, there really wasn't any problems with injury. And this is something that, it's uncommon. It's not often that you go through a baseball season, no matter how your rotation's built, even if you have a whole bunch of rubber arms, guys who don't often get injured, you know, more soft throwers. There's no guarantee that you're going to get through a season without injuries. This is baseball and pitchers get injured. That's just what happened. And yeah, it kind of was like this was a, this was an issue right at right away in spring training like this. This felt like it was going to be a problem pretty quick and it hasn't really solved itself yet in the middle of July, right? Like Alec Manoa, Alec Manoa came out and he made his first start and then he had some arm soreness. Ricky Tiedemann was supposed to be one of the first ones to pitch right off the hop in February and he had some issues and couldn't go. Kevin Gosman didn't make his debut until their last Grapefruit League start. And then despite only having the one Grapefruit League start, he starts in their first series in Tampa against the uh, against the Rays in the regular season. So Kevin Gosman, he hasn't been the same ace version of himself where you, know, you have the team on a two or three game losing streak and they need to stop it. And Kevin Gosman comes out, tosses a gem. He hasn't been that same pitcher for the Blue Jays this year. The number one starter this year, really, their their ace has probably been Chris Bassett, followed by Jose Barrios. Those have been the top two. And then Kikuchi, it's been a mixed bag. And that's an unfortunate thing because he's probably the player who 
if not if when the Jays do sell ahead of the trade deadline, the player who's probably going to net them the biggest return is Yusei Kikuchi. And this is starting to look similar to back in um, the rebuilding days, 2018, when they traded away Jay Happ. You know, he he had been one of their best starters the first two years of that contract. And then in the third year, slows down a little bit before the trade deadline, and they only wind up getting Brandon Drury and Billy McKinney. So, you know, not really ideal for the Blue Jays if your your best trade asset and one of your mid-rotation starters is kind of up and down and you're wondering eh, are they going to be able to net a good return here but yeah the expectation was that or not the expectation but the hope the need for the Jays to be successful was you have to look at the starting pitching and what it did last year you needed very similar seasons you needed an ace-like season again from Gosman you needed you know Yusei Kikuchi and Barrios to come and do their thing again you need Bassett to log a bunch of innings you needed one of Manoa or you know, Yariel Rodriguez or Bowden Francis or whoever it is to fill what Hyunjin Ryu provided for the team last year as well as a nice depth starter who came back halfway through the year. But that hasn't happened. Ricky Tiedemann, like you mentioned, only made a handful of starts in AAA. He's injured again after coming back from his rehab assignment. It's just anything pretty much you could have thought of as aside from like, I mean, outside of a big name like a Gosman or a Barrios or somebody having a major injury, but losing Manoa to Tommy John, who knows how he's going to come back. It's just, yeah, you, everything that went wrong pretty much has gone wrong. Yeah, <clears throat> and then the other thing that was great last year was the bullpen. The Blue Jays rode the back of a very strong bullpen, one of the best in baseball. And who were the guys behind it? It was Jordan Romano, Eric Swanson, it was Tim Meza, and it was, to an extent, Jimmy Garcia last season. And then you look this year, and... All four of those guys have been zeros. Two of them banged up. The other two have been injured and, and and really haven't pitched a lot this season outside of the first month, I suppose, for Garcia. Chad Green has been banged up this year. That's a guy who you were looking at as a piece who could come in and you know maybe help the bullpen a little bit, even if they took a bit of a step back. But it wasn't a step back. It was, a again, a massive pushback. It was 30 steps back. Like to, For those guys to all go from, with the exception, I guess, Garcia, but last year... Mesa, Swanson, Romano all could have been all-stars. And now you look, again, all zeros, not contributing anything. It's not like they got mildly worse. They went from being top of their craft to unplayable or not playing. It's a stunning step back. They have the second worst bullpen ERA in the majors at 4.91. When your bullpen is giving up on average a run and a half every two innings is basically what that works out to. Like, that's insane. Yeah, this was probably of the three downs we have, the bats and the starting rotation. This is the biggest this is the biggest surprise. Like the injuries to the starting rotation, again, it's baseball. This is a thing that happens. They had a really good season last year. It's hard to imagine it being that good. A small regression seems normal. The bats not bouncing back. Yeah, it's pretty normal. Like <laughs> we I, I don't think anybody you should reasonably expect, you know, a George Springer in his early mid 30s to suddenly have a huge season but the big thing is um the bullpen it, it it it's not something that we were really talking about coming into the season at all as a possibility i think if you thought that one thing was going to go wrong it's you look at the starting pitching depth and you think oh geez there isn't really very much there there are, if it, an injury or two is going to make this really difficult to get around but the bullpen you looked at all the names and you thought there are so many names in the mix here that for this to go south, so much would have to go wrong. And ultimately, so much did go wrong. Like Jordan Romano, he's had two different injuries this year, and he's pretty much barely pitched. And it feels like we're not going to see all that much of him down the stretch because, I mean, who needs a closer in a season like this? Ultimately, you need Jordan Romano to be healthy next season. Eric Swanson had the disaster in spring training. His son got hit by a car. And I would imagine that plays a role in why he hasn't been as good this season as he was last. That's a pretty reasonable thing, but it's such a freak incident to happen. Nobody nobody saw that coming. Nobody saw Eric Swanson suddenly being ineffective. How much he pitched for the Blue Jays last year, especially in the first half, he was so important. And then Tim Meza, there was an argument to be made last season that he was the best left-handed relief pitcher in baseball. And then he pitches so poorly, he gets designated for assignment. No one even claims him, and he gets released and has to sign a minor league deal. Like, again, if you had said that in the offseason Tim Mesa is going to get not just you know claimed on waivers or traded somewhere else because he's struggling but released outright is again shocking so three guys who were great have completely fallen off a cliff and then you know two two pitchers two veteran pitchers who were supposed to be you know maybe the number five 
number four, number six guy in your bullpen, somebody pitching in the seventh inning or something like that. Guys like Jimmy Garcia and Chad Green have had to throw so many innings that, of course, Garcia wound up getting injured in what looked like an all-star season. If he had stayed healthy, there's an argument to be made that he's going down to Texas to participate in the all-star game. And then Chad Green, he had an injury as well and has been largely effective, but he's had to pitch so much that there's also some blown saves in there. It kind of just is what it is. He's basically at this point right now with Garcia injured, Swanson down, Romano injured, and Mazin gone chad green's really their only reliable depth bullpen piece that they have available like everybody else that's coming in in leverage situations it's zach pop and nate pearson who both have eras in the five it's guys from the waiver wire brendan little um, ryan burr just looking at names like just random random pitchers that they're grabbing from the scrap heap it doesn't feel like a competitive season this year it feels like something more like 2018 or 19 where they were just figuring out who can pitch next like i mean it's not quite edwin jackson we have nobody else who else is going to pitch i don't even know it's not quite that level of bad but it's you know it's 2021 tyler chatwood Raphael dolis tommy malone just looking for whoever can pitch out of the bullpen and that's just not what we expected this year that the, the blue jays are supposed to have a whole bunch of pitching depth they're supposed to have that you know pitching factory in dunedin and the great drafting and developing and there's non-stop arms like the tampa bay rays have that's what they were supposed to be and it just simply has not happened and that's why the bullpen imploding is such a disappointing thing for the blue jays like starting pitching yeah it's hard it's difficult to find guys who can pitch multiple innings but a bullpen you should be able to put together a good bullpen with just organizational depth there's a lot of teams that do this year in year out with random names and the jays haven't been able to do it this is supposed to be a pitching team and it hasn't even been that yeah and i mean to give the front office to cut them a bit of slack again this isn't just like it's not like it was just a jordan romano injury and we're sitting here being like oh the bullpen fell apart like to have things this go this bad and this wrong for five key guys like that pretty much is an entire bullpen right there. The only guy who's able to consistently pitch is Nate Pearson, and he doesn't consistently pitch well, which is, again, an, another probably comment on, like you said, the N Dunedin Pitching Factory, where a guy like Nate Pearson who comes in with the stuff that he has isn't able to become, never mind an everyday starter, which he probably should have been as a first-round pick, but an everyday bullpen guy, a consistent back-of-the-bullpen guy. So I... It, Cut him some slack, but also, again, when you look at a guy like Pearson, they haven't been able to properly develop him. Alec Manoa fell off a cliff. Like, I think you bring up a good point there. That's probably a larger conversation that needs to be had at some point here. But anyways, the three downs, they are obvious. It's the bats. It's the rotation. It's the bullpen. Everything went wrong. <laughs> what went well? Um, we'll get into that. But first, let's step aside for a quick break. Back on episode 229 of Blue Jays Nation Radio, the downside of the first half took us about 15 minutes to go through. I don't think the up portion will take us that long, but let's start with one thing, and that's Vladimir Guerrero Jr. After a really miserable start to the season, Vladdy's actually bounced back nicely and is now in line to have a better season than he did a year ago for the Jays. His OPS is up a significant amount of points. Um, Vladdy's looking like, again, returning to the form of being a legit middle of the, the order 3-4 hitter that can do this for, I think, a decade. Yeah, he is. This is um, after last season, I think it... It was a difficult one to look at it last season, and I guess if you mix it together with um, 2022, that wasn't a bad season, though. It was kind of an up-and-down one, but if you looked at last year, and there was there was always the, the kind of talk that Vladdy was dealing with some kind of injury. Maybe it was a knee. I remember there was times where he didn't... He, there was a series in May, I think they were playing in Pittsburgh, that he missed some action. There was a series against New York at home early in the season as well when he went in to make a defensive play and um, was staggering around on his knee and there was always a talk last season there was something going on injury wise and this year Vladdy looks more healthy and more locked in he looks more looks more comfortable and 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 his numbers yeah they're not really eye popping numbers 288 batting average 815 OPS 14 home runs but it was a slow start to the season and when he kind of came out of that early funk Vladdy had probably one of the better runs and I'd say most of the month of june maybe late may as well probably one of his better runs at the plate just when you look at him in the batter's box the way he's swinging the way he's making contact with the ball the confidence that he has 
he looks like he's having the best run that he's had in 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 a couple of years like probably since his 2021 runner up mvp season the the little run that he had there in in late may and june so that's that's one positive from the season is that after after last year you looked at it and you thought you know, is Vladdy the kind of player that you want to offer a 10 year, 15 year contract, whatever it winds up being to? Is this the kind of guy you want to lock in and have be a Blue Jay for life? Are you going to, you know, sign that contract? Are you going to go to Rogers and ask for the 300 plus million to make it happen, whatever it winds up being? And after last season, um, given the way he performed at the major league level, it was, there was skepticism around that. It's starting to look like, is this really a superstar player or is this uh, an all star caliber player? Someone who's good one year, not great the next year you kind of go back and forth but i mean maybe we're just reaching for positives but vladi does again this season look like a star player and and the numbers don't necessarily support it it's not like he has the exact same stat line right now that he did in 2021 but just watching him play looking looking at him take at bats he looks stronger and looks better than he has in the past couple of years i think and also, who knows if you put him in a bit of a better lineup, how much better yeah. the results could potentially be as well. Um, you know, if you it sounds kind of dumb, but like if you're in more games where your team has scored six or seven runs, you're getting deeper into bullpens, facing less effective bullpen arms. Maybe your numbers get juiced up a little bit. We always know about, you know, throwing a good batter behind him and things like that. So I don't know for him to be doing this on a team that's as piss poor offensively as the Jays are, I think is a really, really good sign. Um, number two with the injuries and with the struggles means young players get opportunities. That's really what we're looking for here. Um, and one guy who's been a big positive is Spencer Horwitz. I think you could give a little thumbs up to Leo Jimenez in the early stages of his career. Davis Schneider now in his first full big league league season but for me Spencer Horwitz is is kind of the shining light here of all of the Buffalo boys he looks like the one who out of that group like I think Ernie Clement has a future as a bottom of the roster can move around the diamond hit a little bit when you need him to but he's not an everyday player I think Davis Schneider can be a guy who maybe one day is an everyday player but is probably walking that line between bench guy everyday option Spencer Horwitz I think has a chance to be an everyday MLB -er and a good one at that yeah, he does kind of, this has been one of the positives. And last year, the positive from AAA Buffalo was David Schneider coming up and having his, you know, legendary debut. He injected life into the team in the latter half of the season when they really badly needed it. David Schneider was huge for the Jays last year. And then this year, they've had Spencer Horwitz come up and kind of be that guy. Of course, it hasn't been, it hasn't been the same as Schneider last year where he came up and just had a record setting debut and helped the team go on a little hot streak because the team's were this year than they were last year but Horowitz when you look at his numbers he's been up now for 32 games he's made 121 plate appearances the batting average is all the way up at um, 342 and the OPS is at 912 there was skepticism about whether he's going to hit for any power but he's hit four home runs and five doubles which is positive um, the 14 walks to 17 strikeouts that's the thing that always that people always raved about with Horowitz when he was in the minors um, was that he had the good eye and that he was going to be the kind of batter who comes up and you see what's good about him over the course of a longer sample size he's going to take long at bats he's going to see pitches he's going to draw walks he's going to do things like that and it's, I think it's sort of been the positive of this season because the defense has been fine too he's moving around playing different positions like it's harder to justify a first base DH type who takes a lot of walks and isn't a guy hitting for a tremendous amount of power in that spot you want your first base DH obviously to hit a whole bunch of bombs and doubles but Horowitz is more of an on-base guy but having him playing second he's played left field in the minors as well though he isn't really playing left field with the Blue Jays but Given that he's been fine defensively and has been a really good on base guy, I think that's positive. This is a this is a good thing for the Jays that they're showing they can develop position players. Like I just got through a rant saying it's surprising the Jays haven't done a good job in developing pitchers better than they have. You know, like we're 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 far enough into the Shapiro and Atkins era here. Like they showed up in late 2015. It's been long enough now that they should have done like they should have done enough that 
they can develop and develop pitchers, draft and do that thing. But interestingly enough, it's been the position players where they've seen more success. And I guess that's a positive from this season is that there was a whole bunch of question mark names we saw down in AAA Buffalo ahead of the season. And obviously not everyone's come up and set the world on fire. Addison Barger has had a slow start or Elvis Martinez got busted for using PEDs. So we can't just really label AAA Buffalo as a huge positive all told, but the Horowitz thing, the Leo Jimenez thing, I think those two are solid positives. The Jays are able to develop some some decent position players, I think, is uh I think there's a that that's a positive. That's a win. Yep, yep that's fair. Um third one we had is and, and I love that you wrote, <laughs> we're really reaching here, but aesthetically pleasing first half in terms of the renovations are cool. The city connects ended up better than we expected. Again, if this team was talented on the field to see a new look stadium going nuts a couple of times a week, to see them doing cool shit in the city connects, it would have been a lot of fun. I think like business wise, they've done well, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think um, if you yeah, we're reaching. we're reaching and I mean, yeah, this is this is a reach. This is a reach like Jay's <laughs> games are more expensive now, but the stadium looks better. There's more things to do at the stadium to not pay attention to the game. That's positive. Like you can go up and play in the little arcade or you can go and stand in a food line and eat something different, and unique that you usually wouldn't eat at a you know Toronto Blue Jays baseball game. So that's good. But yeah, the uh, the positive thing here that I wanted to pull up was the City Connect jerseys are way better than I thought they were going to be. Like this was one of those things early in the season where anytime any leak or anything about it got posted, it was just unanimously negative. People were just crapping all over it and thought this is going to look corny. This is going to be stupid. But Jays came out with a nice jersey. It looks good aesthetically. They had some good moments in it too. Walk-offs wearing a cool new jersey. But yeah, this is us reaching. We... Uh, <laughs> This is us reaching for positives. My original thing that I had written down here, my third up, and I was um, decided not to go with it because I thought, ah, you know what? We can find something actually positive. My my third up was originally going to be that we have reached the all-star break. We don't have to watch a Blue Jays game for about four days here. That was originally going to be my positive number three. So I found an actual positive to uh, to, uh, to to slide in there. All right, moving away from the first half, Coombsy, uh, you are going to do a bit of in-depth draft stuff a little bit uh, later on this week, and, and we'll get someone who is a, a bit more dialed into sort of the prospect pipeline to give us some insight. Um, but the Toronto Blue Jays did have a pick in the first round yesterday, and they went with Trey Yasavage um, at 20th overall. He was actually ranked 11th on MLB's pipeline list this season. He's a 20, uh, 20 year old from East Carolina has some good numbers. Um, it honestly feels like a solid pick. I know Ben Badler, who's a prospect analyst for baseball America wrote getting a top 10 talent at 20th overall said that's good work for the blue Jays. Baseball America had another quote that the gap between chase Burns and Hagen Smith and Troy Savage is minuscule. At most, they said this is unbelievable value for Toronto getting him at 20th. So on one hand, I want to be excited about this. On the other hand, I read a tweet from Ben Nicholson Smith that outlines the Blue Jays first round pick since 2016. And it's TJ Zoic never really did anything. Logan Warmoth never really did anything. Nate Pearson, a war of negative 0.09. Jordan Groshans never did anything, was traded in the Anthony Bastille. Alec Manoa. Good pick, but right now I'm not feeling that good about that. Austin Martin, I guess you could say he was used for Berea, so he's good. So I want to be excited that all the prospect analysts are saying, boom, the Jays got great value. This is a tremendous pick, but I'm also going to sit there and, and be a little bit hesitant to give them too much applause because they really haven't done that much good in the draft for the last number of years, the last decade, you could almost say. Yeah, they really haven't. I mean, the <clears throat> a few of them got traded away, of course. There's yeah. Austin Martin, like you said. He was traded away in the Jose Barrios deal, so that's that. And there was Gunnar Hoagland the following year after that. First-round pick pitcher who was moved in the Matt Chapman deal. For Brandon Barriera, the high school pitcher they selected in um, 2022, I think that would have been. His first two seasons have been mostly wiped due to injury, which is very unfortunate. And last year, it was Arjun Namala, um, who was the youngest first-round pick in that draft. I think he's... I don't think he's even turned 19 yet. He's still younger than a lot of guys in this year's draft. So jury's still really far out. The first round picks that they had had early in the um, 
early in the in the Cleveland career and Toronto, like the TJ Zoics, the JB Woodmans, Logan Warmoths, those were, yeah, those were picks that didn't really ultimately wind up doing anything. So the Jays have found some level of success with their later picks in the draft. They've had some good second round picks, like Bo Bichette, for example, second round pick out of high school. But that's sort of what is ultimately carrying the this front office and the Blue Jays with their drafts is there haven't really been that many hits and there's been you know finding Bo Bichette obviously has been Bo Bichette and Alec Manoa were kind of like the two big wins that everybody talked about the Blue Jays you know drafted and developed these two guys but like I said in two different points the Jays they were supposed to be a drafting and developing team they were supposed to be a Tampa Bay Rays style team that constantly had you know talent through the draft that was going to augment their expensive core at the big league level your Bo Vlad Springer you know the pitching staff they're expensive you're supposed to have all these young cheap expensive controllable guys coming up and that hasn't happened yet but the hope is that this first round pick here in 2024 Treya Savage he's got he's got like the build and the stuff that he looks kind of like a number two number three starter maybe he's um listed at six foot four 225 pounds his fastball sits around 93 95 miles an hour and peaks out at 98 uh, he also carries a low 80s spike curveball and a splitter with similar velocity and both have you know swing and miss stuff he has strikeout stuff so yeah that is the pro that that is the profile of the kind of guy who you'd hope moves through the system pretty quickly and can be an effective pitcher at the big league level but yeah the jays really need to start hitting on some of these picks here because they just they haven't really been the drafting and develop drafting and developing team that 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 we kind of hope that they were going to be yeah, 100%. Uh, all right, moving along here. Quick quote from USA Today's Bob Nightingale, who said, Baseball executives are starting to believe that Blue Jays GM Ross Atkins, Padres GM AJ Preller, and Farhan Zidi, the Giants president of baseball operations, all have to make the playoffs to assure they keep their jobs. He ends it by saying, Atkins appears to be in the most danger, to which I respond, no shit. Um, but it really does feel like there's a handful of dead men walking here in this back half of the season. They're obviously not making the playoffs. And that will, I think, again, if, if Bob Nightingale's saying it, and I think it's only a matter of time until the other insiders start following suit, this season's going to end. Ross Atkins will be fired. They will hire a new GM who will then fire John Schneider and bring in his own manager. The only disappointing part of it for me is like we all kind of know that it's coming to the end of the road here for both Atkins and Schneider. I would imagine they know as well. And it is a bit disappointing again in the back half of the season. No big name sexy prospect to come up and give us a lot of excitement for next year. No new manager that's at least building and, and doing something. And we could say, hey, look at the culture they have going here with a new man. Like nothing positive will happen in the back half of the season. I am positive of that. It's just going to be running this thing out. Let's play out the final 65 some odd games or whatever it is. And let's watch everyone get fired in the middle of October. Yeah, I think I think um, there was a quote from Shai Davidi. I think it was in late June. Um, it talked about um, there was this. This was right when the Jays were it, they were really falling out of the playoff race, and people were starting to get upset and kind of asking for you know when Zakin's going to get fired, when are they going to fire John Schneider, blah 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 blah, like as fans generally tend to do. And um, Shai Davidi said that he mentioned that the Blue Jays really value stability and continuity in the front office. And you look through at the time that um, Shapiro has been here and there haven't really been too many firings. There was a hitting coach in 2018. Was it Brooke Jacoby? I think it might have been that mm -hmm. that wound up getting fired during that era. There was uh, they just let John Gibbons contract expire. That wasn't a firing. If I'm remembering correctly, Charlie Montoyo was the big notable firing they had that was probably a little unexpected a few months into the 2022 season when they need to turn things around they brought john schneider and of course who always felt like he was going to be the manager and sort of turn that season around a little bit but yeah i mean i don't i don't really blame john schneider for what's going on here i don't really know how you could make anything more out of this roster i don't think it's his bullpen decisions or pinch hitting decisions or lineups that are resulting in the blue jays this roster being what it is but yeah the ross atkins thing i mean i have a hard time I even have a hard time really understanding why they're letting him kind of do the teardown here at all. Like they're obviously not doing a full teardown where they're trading 
Bo, Vlad, Gosman, Barrios, everybody. It's just going to be, you know, the impending free agents, Kikuchi, Jansen, Garcia, et cetera, et cetera. I'm even a little bit surprised that they're they're letting Atkins go ahead and do this, given, you know, he's already had a chance to tear down a team once, traded away Aaron Sanchez, Marcus Stroman, Josh Donaldson, names like that the first time around. And, you know, you look at the first, I guess, half, the first rebuild try they had and, there weren't a tremendous amount of good trades that were made that set the Blue Jays up for the future. Like the one they did make that I thought is a very obvious clear win was when Francisco Liriano went to um, Houston in 2017 in exchange for Tay Oscar. That was the great move that they made. But you think about the other ones they've done, like the J.A. Happ one that I mentioned earlier, McKinney and Drury, Aaron Sanchez, they hung on for a long time and wound up only getting Derek Fisher. It was like a change of scenery deal for two struggling players. Marcus Stroman goes to the Mets for Anthony Kay and Simeon Woods Richardson. Anthony Kay doesn't do anything. Woods Richardson's part of the trade for Jose Barrio, so that's fine. But Josh Donaldson for Julian Merriweather, it's it's a whole bunch of we're holding on for guys for too long and not getting that much in return. And I worry that that's what they're doing right now, too. But I mean, I think a lot of fans would like to see Atkins out the door before the trade deadline, and then maybe somebody else comes in and tries to find their own prospects. But I, I I think they're just giving Atkins the keys to make these trades mid-season, and then I think that somebody new is going to come in. And then that Shai Davidi thing that I mentioned when they were talking about how nobody really gets fired from the Blue Jays, it sort of seems like, and Davidi did hint at this, Atkins moves into a different position within the Blue Jays' front office, one that's maybe not a necessarily a day-to-day decision-making role. And James Click, who used to be the general manager of the Houston Astros, then comes in and tries to lead the Blue Jays through a one-year retool because, yeah, all signs are indicating they're going for it in 2025. And I'm not sure there's even really a choice. Like, Rogers expects that 2024 and 25, they're going to be competitive seasons. Mark Shapiro signed a contract, a five-year deal in 2000, uh, for 2020 through 2025, where the expectation was competitive baseball. And to pivot from that and go into a full-on rebuild, it's just it's not going to happen. So... Here we are. I, I I hope that two, three years from now, we don't sit here and think, oh, man, I wish they had blown it up harder in 2024 because that's kind of where I'm sitting right now. It was I, I wish they had blown it up in 2017 or even just after 2016 it probably would have made a big difference. But I, I do I do worry there that that, that history is sort of repeating itself here. Yeah. All right, uh, we'll continue that kind of conversation all throughout the back half of the season here. Uh, but here's what's coming up next. Uh, tonight, Home Run Derby, Tuesday All-Star Game weekend. Uh, they host the Detroit Tigers. Coombsy, the Home Run Derby this year will feature one former Blue Jay in Teoscar Hernandez. He'll be going up against the likes of Pete Alonso, Alec Baum, Marcelo Zuna, Jose Ramirez, Adolis Garcia, and a couple of young guys in Gunnar Henderson and Bobby Witt Jr. And I know what you're thinking. Is there a way that they can make the home run derby more confusing? And they have this year with an exciting twist on the rules. Um, I Okay, the one I like is that all eight players will just go in the first round. And then whoever hits the most home runs out of those eight, those are the four that advance. And then they seed it from there to do one versus four, two versus three. What I don't like is this part. Again, I actually kind of liked the timer versus like the 10 yeah. out because it kept it moving a little bit yeah. and you didn't have guys going up there and like taking three pitches in a row. Um, but here's what they did this year. While the three rounds remain the same in terms of length, which is again, three minutes, they're also adding a pitch limit of 40 pitches, which feels like an unnecessary way to confuse it, but whatever. So it's whatever happens first, either three minutes goes or they face 40 pitches in that one. Um, in the finals, the hitters will be allotted two minutes or 27 pitches, whichever comes first. Um, so they've basically added a bunch of tiny little rules that will be incredibly confusing. And anyone who's watching this thing for the first time is probably just going to be like, what the hell is going on with this thing? Um, and the bonus pitches are also no longer on a timer. If you hit two home runs that are 440 feet or more, then I think you just get like a couple more pitches at the end, not like an extra 60 seconds. I I don't, simpler the better when it comes to shit like this. I don't like that they're adding like 30 rule changes, but it's also the home run derby, so I barely give a shit to begin with. 
Yeah, I don't know. I thought they had a I thought they had a really good um yeah. they had a really good recipe going in the past few years where it seemed like guys were having to, you know, just keep swinging and swinging and swinging. It was kind of fun. It matched in with the whole vibe of the pitch clock. Like that was a whole thing with Major League Baseball and just sort of matched that everybody's in this little confined time box where they have to do their thing in that amount of time. It seemed really simple and straightforward and really solid, but I think you you had it right when you said it's the home run derby and who really cares? <laughs> exactly. Uh, that is the end of the first half of the season for the Blue Jays and for us at BJN Radio. Uh, we will be back later on this week. Or I should say Coomzy will be back later on this week. And then the second half of the season will begin and we'll see who ends up playing for the Jays and what they have in store. Uh, but that's a wrap on half numero uno. Coomzy, enjoy a little bit of downtime here with the Blue Jays not playing for a handful of days. And we will chat again in a couple weeks. Best wishes. Thanks for tuning in to Blue Jays Nation Radio. Don't forget to like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from to never miss an episode.